lots of right answers. Again, technology is moving really fast. So less emotion, more pragmatism. Let's look at the merit of the products. And again, not, not like what we think or what we've been uh, reading or what some you know, marketing guys told us or told our boss, more likely. And they're just databases. They're just tables. We all, you know, if you're on SQL Server, you know, select from where. If you're on Postgres, select from where. Oracle, uh, you, you run your credit card, then select from where. So working on the enterprise in the SQL Server world, you try and bring up something like Postgres. And you get the, well, it's open source. That, you know, that means it sucks. And there's different types of open sources. There's like me, you know, in my mom's basement working on a little, you know, program that, you know, that does suck. It's only me and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to learn. But, I, you know, I get free hosting for open source. And I agree, you know, that's, that's bad open source. That's not open source you want in your enterprise. But then you have something like Postgres, where you have a lot of talented people coming together to build, you know, something very, very enterprisey, very robust. And it's not, it's not black and white. You know, th th there's different levels of open source. To try and, like, cast something away as just open source is a very silly and worthless argument. I'm a visual learner. I like to visuals. I mean, you've seen some pictures. They help me understand. And, uh, you know, not everyone here is a native English speaker. I talk kind of fast. So how I try and visualize Postgres and SQL Server is that we'll have Postgres. Does anyone know where this is going? And you have SQL Server, right? <laughs> you have Postgres, you know, which is very much on freedom and exploring and pushing forward, working together. Let's solve and let's fix things. And you have kind of the older guard, which, you know, Ken Longshanks still gets things done, right? He has a lot of power, but it may not be in a way that's best for everyone. And, uh, yeah? So is it possible to reduce the light a little bit? Because it's very hard to see pictures. I mean, I've got some, I can break them, but maybe the switches. Does is that better? <laughs> no. I don't know how to get Man, this dog, I can like just go sit now and, and talk. All right, was everyone cool with this? All right, so this is kind of one way to visualize it. You know, both, both people get things done, but you can argue they get things done in a very different way, in a very different method. And you kind of maybe need to decide which method works better for you. And again, this is not an exaggeration at all. Right, this isn't a little hyperbole for fun. I've been saying that technology moves fast. In SQL Server, you're at a three year or more release cycle. So SQL Server 2012 was just dropped. If there's something you don't like or it's something that sucks in it, you know, guess what you're stuck with for three years? When something, you know, when you don't like something in Postgres, it's a much faster release cycle. So I mean, it starts to move with you and build with you. And, uh, Again, if there's something you don't like in SQL Server, you better get a job at a company that has a lot more influence on that product if you want that change. To me, just in my basement saying, hey, Microsoft, this sucks, fix it, the response is probably not as welcoming as if someone, you know, spending a billion dollars on their products. So I've seen a lot of Linux boxes here, obviously a lot of Macs. I just want to share with you guys, like, why I pick Windows and why I like Windows. First off, in Linux, you have all these file systems that do things really well and all these different options. And like that is hard and confusing. I just want NTFS and I want there to be problems reading and writing with it. You know, I, don't, I don't want all these choices. The other one is that when I have a dedicated database server that's supposed to only be a database server, I need a browser and I need media plugins and I need a games folder on that server, right? Because <laughs> migrations, they can sometimes take a while and I need to be able to play those games and stuff while I'm on the box. That's, that's a real worthwhile thing to have on your server. The other thing is, RAM is a renewable resource. I don't know if you guys knew that. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's really cheap. So like, if my OS, just my OS, is using four gigs of RAM, that's cool, because RAM is a free commodity. And lastly, I have no idea what an SSH is, right? I hear the Linux people, they talk about these SSHs, and I'm like, I don't know that. I don't want to know it. I can't imagine what it would possibly be good for. That's why I'm so happy that Windows has no effort to support it. Right? That's, that's one of those key features that we love about Windows. 
And if that hasn't sold you, there's even more reasons to really enjoy Windows. So I was doing a side-by-side -side installer of you know, Ubuntu 12.4 server and a Windows server. And you see that at the time that the Linux server finished, Windows is still unpacking 18% of its files for installing. I like this because I'm a very laid back person. <laughs> and I, in my jobs, I'm paid hourly. So the fact that Linux wants to like, be done, so I have to start working, that's, I'm not interested in that. Right? You know, take your time, installer. You know, I want to go get a croissant or something and you know, worry about other things. Likewise, SQL Server and Microsoft have made installing SQL Server incredibly easy. If you've ever bought something from IKEA and seen how many steps it takes to build furniture, you'll appreciate this. Microsoft has added an installer to the installer. This helps simplify things. Because once you're worried about the installer, it helps you out by spawning up another installer to help you install. <clears throat> and once you get past the installer's installer, again, it's only 22 simple steps and screens that you have to go through to configure your server. It's a piece of cake. <clears throat> and lastly, I think Microsoft is jealous of Schemaverse and that Postgres has a game in it. So they decided to take the installer and make it a game. I mean, it's that complicated. So if you install SQL Server, you get your trophy. You don't have to compete against other people. It's like, it's like golf. It's a one-on-one -on -one type sport. <clears throat> so, I'm first, so coming from that and being used to that, when I went to install Postgres, I was really confused. Because what? <laughs> That's all I do? And I kept trying to type in even more things and figure out like, what to do, because it can't be that easy. I mean, that's silly. <clears throat> Electrosoft licensing. This is a fun topic. This early, the session before mine, it was all on the wall in, the, in deep internals of Postgres and just how all that chaining works, very complicated. That's pretty much light stuff compared to Microsoft licensing. Microsoft licensing is like what the Mensa people look up to in terms of like complicated problems to solve. It's ridiculous. So we're going to go over just kind of roughly and kind of gloss on a little bit of Microsoft licensing to get a server that has like a, a feature match with Postgres. So let's say our server just has 16 logical cores. You know, again, pretty common in this day and age. So all you do is you take the number of logical tors, cores times a variant core factor table, then you divide that by two for the core pack pricing, right? Not too bad. Let's take that polynomial, put in some numbers. So our box is only $106,000 in change just, just for our server licensing, our SQL server licensing. That's not bad, right? That was just a cost of a couple developers. Is that one year? Hmm? Is that one year cost? Or is that it's uh, perpetual. It's, you buy it once, and then, um, then it just stagnates and falls apart, and okay. you leave it. it with the hope that in, it'll be gotten so bad over three years that you buy a new license for a whole new licensing, licensing model. Yep, so out of the box, um, who works at a smaller company? Does anyone here work at a smaller company or startup? Is that a pretty agreeable price for you? Like, do you guys just, you know, shell that out? Like, what's, what's... For hardware. Right. But, like, a price on top of that. To me, this, like, totally eliminates... Um, I talk to open source people and they're like, you know, what's your horizontal scaling like? And I'm like, none. Everything's vertical. Because, like, if you go to your CFO and you're like, okay, we just need $104,000 for a single, single, a single SQL server, and I'd say, like, well, we need, to, we need to scale a little horizontally. Let's, you know, just multiply this by six. And they'd be like, no, dude, forget it. You know, go, back, go back to your installer. And, and then that price makes our Windows Server license look like chump change, which you know, only 1,500 and change. I'm trying to give this, you know, for our SQL Server box, that's, you know, comparison feature-wise with Postgres, only 107,000 and change, almost 108,000 USD. On top of that, it's like these products ship, they're labeled as enterprise, you know, marketing's really gotten into your boss, you buy it. But there's a lot of things that still suck in it. A lot of things that are real cumbersome and hard to use. So you end up having to buy third party tools and applications on top of that, which again, just more hidden cost, not particularly fun. But again, that's the licensing, the installing, that's all the hard stuff. Let's get, you know, let's, let's get past all that. Now, let's, let's, let's let your boss or your CFO worry about that. Let's get right to the meat and guts of our products. So SQL Server installs with a default 
max RAM usage of 2,000 terabytes. Who's running the 2,000 terabyte servers? What? No one? Okay, one. Cool. Seriously, or are you just like throwing that out there? To... Okay. <laughs> I know. What this means is that, let's say, uh, let's say you have an 8 gig box, you know, box with 8 gigs in it, and your data set's you know, 30 gigs. When you go to load everything in your buffer cache, your box is just going to grind to its knees because this is a very non-safe default. It, it says that I'm going to keep using up to two, you know, 2,000 terabytes, so this, you know, that 8 gigs gets run over really quickly. <laughs> It's, it's really annoying, and it doesn't really make sense why they do it. That's just one of those things. SQL Server also has an option to compress defaults, or, or compress backups by default. It doesn't do that. It's like, you know, that would be such a free win to have out of the box, not have to configure, but they don't do that. Uh, who's still using pagers? I've seen some people with cell phones. Oh, dudes. Really? <laughs> so what's cool on SQL Server is that you still have support for pagers for the, you know, the two people that are still stuck in that day and age, which which is kind of motivation for that, uh, that uh, King Longshanks picture earlier, because that, that time was so long ago that I thought that picture went well with this pager option. And if, if pager doesn't work for you, you can, use, you can still send alerts and stuff over the deprecated protocol of NetSend, which was, I think, removed in Vista. Really handy stuff. Functions and indexes and queries, this is cool stuff. In SQL Server, we have index-only queries. That's awesome. And you guys will get there eventually. But once you have them, they're so fun, and it helps you so much with performance. What we can't do is we can't index functions at all. So as soon as we start to run a query on, in uh, one, of, you know, one of our columns has a function on it, we're going straight to table scans. That sucks. So it's an interesting trade-off between the two products of like, there's a give here and there's a take here. But again, Postgres is itera iterating really fast. And What's true today, like the index-only queries, won't be true tomorrow. So it's, that's part of the advantage of having a very fast-moving product that cares and works, to, uh, works with you. So maintenance. In SQL Server, it requires a 20% change in your record set before it will auto-update stats, which means that a lot of time I'm having to go in and manually update our stats. That's not real fun. Indexes, they defrag, or they get fragmented. So I have to manually go in and defragment, and reorganize, and rebuild those. That's not real fun. Because depending on which version of SQL Server you have, and which version and which service pack, sometimes it's blocking, sometimes it's not. So you get to play that game. And the worst part of all is I have real control over all this. So in, um, is this right in Postgres? Postgres, you can configure at what percentage or what, um, that your stats will update or look at that. It doesn't like default to 20, 20%, 20 but you can change that. Like, I mean, you have control over it. Right? Okay, thanks. Backups. This is something that I had <laughs> a real struggle with when I went to Postgres. It's because in SQL Server, backups are part of the engine. You just run T-SQL and you get your backup and you're good to go. And here, like, we're just pumping out to null, which gives you a really fast backup but it's much harder to recover from. <laughs> so, I mean, I like that, that um, you know, I didn't have to work or jump out to cron jobs or anything like that. I can just issue straight SQL and get that. And when I tried to do that in Postgres, and looking at the backup story in Postgres, I thought it was a much different uh, angle to it. I mean, I can use PG dump, I can use PG dump all, I can just spit out data. There's all these other, all these other, um, programs that I can add on and install on it, like it, it was, whoa, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to do backups. Um, what do you guys think? Would you guys like backups to be part of the PL SQL, that you can issue it inside the engine? No? Yes? You can raise hands, you don't have to shout it, I mean, I can't see anything, so. The, the only thing that's nasty about this is when I have to do a dump or a backup on my SQL server off like a remote file system. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, it's kind of not possible. That, you have to have a huge amount of extra space to bring my backups in and out on my SQL server. Yeah. You can back up individual tables by having copies. Yes, and you can do different file groups. And you, there's some ways to trick it, but 
But ultimately, what he's saying is that you're, you're stuck with that command and its limitations regardless. So um, different permissions, like with trying to get it to another box, you know, there's issues there. What it views is, you know, acceptable storage for backing up. There's issues there. So it's, in some ways, it looks convenient, but there's a huge, grass is always greener. There's a trade-off on the back end in terms of your flexibility. Whereas in Postgres, you have so many options right. that. What was your question? Can you, can you issue a backup command within? Well, no, like, what I was trying to lean towards was, would you think it'd be cool in Postgres to have something like just some SQL syntax that you issue a full backup right in the, right in the engine? And the other thing, when you do a copy, it doesn't have a real strong sense of the log chaining, does it? it doesn't it just say, like, I'm just going to barf out all the data in this table? It doesn't, right. like, it's, it's kind of limited in that way. But again, it's, it's an option. It's on the table. I, I just thought, I thought it was a really interesting contrast and approach when I went to Postgres. So query tuning Postgres. I know this is a popular topic or one that people like to jib and jab at. You have your glyphs, you have your, your cost tree, you have your pre-number and your post-number, you know, like your pre-cost and your post-cost, is that right? And people think that, man, that's kind of hacky, like the, it takes a little bit of study to figure out what's going on. You hear some people say that. I, I don't find it too complicated. It's, it's pretty straightforward because I'm kind of used to this. You get these weird glyphs and you get the information on those glyphs. You have to hover over it. You have to wait for this little pop-up to appear. But you have to be completely still because if you move a little bit, the pop-up goes away. Again, you're playing like another game inside your engine of like trying to find what's going on. But I can also get a text-based plan like you see here. But it's just telling me, it's just telling me what's going on. I have no cost there. It's like, okay, well, if I want cost, then it bars out this gigantic XML thing, which most times I print it off and I use it as a NyQuil substitute because it's very verbose and it's just painful. This is something, um, has ever, you guys ever heard the term, you know, will it scale? You know, are all databases, are all tables created equally? Are they all the same size? Do they all have the same, same use cases? No, they don't. So being able to config, or in Postgres being able to um, have global configurations is really cool, but it's kind of hard to get a one shoe fits all for a lot of these things. And when I saw the fact that I can change all these settings on a session by session basis, for like, you know, I have a really ugly use case on this one gigantic table, you know, like most databases have, but I can specialize some of my environmental variables for that, I thought was completely awesome, something I'm not used to. And one of the things that you start to fall in love with Postgres is that it's adapting to how my data is adapting, and to how our application is adapting. It's just working with you the whole way instead of, you know, giving you the middle finger. Modern development, I keep repeating how fast technology moves. And in Postgres, you guys are getting a JSON data type. You're getting V8. These are really popular things that are cool and bring people to your platform, which is awesome. Then I look over at the Microsoft side, and I wonder which edition of SQL Server is going to get V8 in it, or JSON data, data types. And you guys have it in 9.2, and we're going to get it in version 9, isn't the German word for no. <laughs> because it's not going to happen, right? If it does, it'll be like in 2020 when something else is way more popular. Toast. Well, if here, um, my little, uh, my data set that I play with is the uh, raw dumps from Stack Overflow. They, uh, you know, they dump out their data from time to time. You can import it and bring it in. in my SQL server, it's almost 30 gigs of storage space to do it because it doesn't compress by default. And again, you're playing a licensing and versioning game on which edition has compression. And then once you actually can do compression, you have to go in and manually enable it and uh, calculate it. It's really uh, cumbersome. In Postgres, when you get toast, and it's only a little over six gigs, that's crazy. Like, it blew my mind. Again, it's 
I wanted to kiss my Postgres. That's cool. Data types. Postgres, you guys have a data type called timestamp. In SQL Server, we have a data type called a timestamp. It has nothing to do with time and stamps. <laughs> I think it's, it's, just, it's an arbitrary incrementing number. So it, like, that's the kind of thing of when you're trying to learn these products, you're like, oh, okay, timestamp. You know, that's compound word. I can break that down. That makes what? It doesn't make any sense. Postgres, the timestamp is a timestamp. <laughs> Postgres has really cool documentation. And when I look at timestamps, I see all these different options. And I see this, uh, I'm so just programmed to put in dates and times into fields. And I see this thing called infinity. And I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. And I see something called all balls. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what am I inserting all balls? And then I was wondering, what URL am I on? Like, is this, you know, am I in my private browser? What's going on? So that's cool, because in SQL Server world, we're playing that null game and recasting nulls, because we don't have anything like this. Even though business and development, you know, what we're making has these types of scenarios, which is really cool. So Postgres is a database engine, and SQL Server has a database engine, but SQL Server is often sold as a data platform. So you have the engine, you have these little ETL tools that they write, you have this, you know, this reporting server that they, you know, that they try and sell you on too, and you have analysis tools. So that's why, you know, Microsoft would like to shift the conversation away from the engine itself and say, well, you're paying all that money for this, but look what all you're getting. So let's break it down. For data wrappers, that looks like a really cool solution to ETL. In fact, I can query anything, you know, virtually anything with a with a foreign data wrapper is awesome. Also, like ETL is kind of a solved problem. Same with reporting. I mean, it's it's very static data that you you aggregate and you buff out to users. You know, there's not much to that. And again, the SQL Server Reporting Services product, in honesty, I mean, it sucks, right? So you're trying to sell me on something that sucks. I'm like, well, you know, that doesn't carry a lot of weight with me. So what we end up having to do anyways is writing our own reporting option. So again, like what they think is adding value and what they interpret, you know, what they're doing for their marketing checkbox is really a hidden, it's really a hidden uh, cost that your company will take on as you have to work around it and redo it. But analysis services is something really interesting. Because in Postgres, I mean, you don't have parallel query execution, right? You can't just like thread out over all your CPUs, as I understand it. So you have you know, a perceived shortcoming there. In analysis, you know, for hardcore analysis, you want like distributed, parallel, fast execution on large sets of data and aggregates. And out of the box, you don't get that. But Postgres is open source, and it has a really cool community. And you have people like Umar and Citus Data that are trying to fix this problem and coming up with products to do it at a very affordable cost. So that's cool. That's, um, and they have a very, like, they have a very strong motivation to give you the right product and not just be, you know, a marketing company to sell more SQL Server licenses. They want to solve your problems. And it's cool to see that they can take a product that we love, like Postgres, and apply it and solve these things, like analysis issues, in, um, as, that, as that space gets more and more popular. Hey, come on in, dude. Oh, that's cool. And what about our app? Drivers, ORMs, and other gotchas. SQL Server, it works really great with C-sharp, the .NET framework, and it's listed as working with a whole bunch of other things. But the truth is, is that it's only, it only treats .NET as a first-class citizen. Everything else is really hacky feeling. And Microsoft's ORMs, you know, they'll say that they support Postgres, but like, again, that's just a marketing feature. It actually really sucks to use. It has no concept of sequences, it basically has no concept of anything that breaks away from SQL Server assumptions, which is really hard when you're trying to cut over and still you know, use .NET as your programming language. But it is possible. The other thing is, how hard can Linux be? Right? 
so in the Microsoft world, we're told so many times that you know, Microsoft, you know, Linux is incredibly hard to do. You know, you're going to have a hard time with your you know sound card drivers. But again, I think on Linux you don't play games on your servers, right? It doesn't install that stuff. So like, you know, the sound card issue. Who cares? But I'm trying to just get things done. But I don't know. I, I thought Linux was going to be really hard, and really intimidating. But on the server side, I don't think it is. It's pretty straightforward. And I think, uh, I think Postgres on Windows has a couple shortcomings. But I don't blame it. <laughs> and uh, it seems like Postgres is a really good match for Linux. Who wants to look at some code? One? Awesome. So on our VM, I'll fire up Windows. Who's, who's migrated a .NET app to Linux with hardly any code changes? Two guys? You guys using? What? Cool. Yeah, you know, well, a lot of people don't know, especially in the Microsoft world, that there's, there's this project called Mono. It's taken the entire .NET framework in C Sharp and created an open source version of it. And uh, so you think like, man, my .NET code will never run on Linux. It'll never run on Mac. But really, these Mono guys, not only do they make it happen, but in a lot of ways, they improve the language and they improve the platform. It's really interesting, and I apologize that my VM went to sleep on us. What we're going to look at real quick is taking Taking our app, get started with .NET and Postgres. Uh, there's a couple of different drivers you can use. I use the MPG SQL. It's open source. I think you get it on uh, PG Foundry. That's right. Uh, if you don't want to go on the web, um, much like Ruby and Node has, there's a package manager, and you just, you know you do an install MPG, and you're good to go. You have this little data factory. You change your connection string. So this was our old SQL Server connection string there. And then Postgres, you know, it's not much different. You give it a server, you get a database, you give it a user, and you go. Now this app was a little bit different. It could be done in .NET against SQL Server. And I was using Microsoft's ORM entity framework. But any framework doesn't work very well in Mono. It doesn't work very well in Linux. It doesn't work very well in .NET. It's a pretty crappy ORM. So I wanted to gut that, but being a good little developer, I was putting my data in a repository pattern. So what I do is I hop into my repositories. Um, I changed my data layer from very cumbersome and very fragile in any framework to an open source one that I work on called Massive which kind of takes the, uh, the best of active record, that dynamics, and applies it into a very static environment in .NET and C Sharp. But it lets me uh, new up a table, like a spatch table, specify what I want the user ID, add my params, and we go and hit our Postgres server. Okay, this is our same app that, that was calling SQL Server. I'm not, I'm not going to kill you guys with a very boring ETL from SQL Server to Postgres. It's not fun. It's, you know, you map columns, you set your data types, and you press go, and you wait for it to get run. I mean, is that interesting to anyone? Like, does anyone want to see that? Trust me, it's, it's very simple to do, but it's very dry. Like, we've all done migrations. <laughs> we, don't wanna, we don't have enough coffee to watch a migration. So this is basically all I've done. Um, I've got the code up before. You know, this is the same code 
for the most part, if you look in this connection string, this is just SQL Server without the MPG driver. My, con or my uh, class before, this is, this is entity framework code. Again, you new up, you new up your object, and you run a pseudo type SQL language on it, and you return it. Uh, over here, we're, we're passing in a user ID. You know, I just want this user. It's the same thing in any framework. Very straightforward. Again, very little modification, again, using this repository pattern, to just go from SQL Server to Postgres. Way easier than I thought. I thought it was going to be complicated, but the biggest problem I had was trying to use Microsoft's ORM. But you want to get that anyway. So that was, to me, that was a cost I was willing to take on. And we get our data, you know, badges by user ID. It works well, but this is not part of the problem. Because my goal is to take my code and run it on Linux. So I want to get away from some of these, from the, some of this licensing burden. Because, you know, the economy is doing worse. Our product actually sucks. We're losing money. Where can we, you know, where can we cut costs? So deploying to Linux is an interesting endeavor just from the lack of SSH on Windows. So the real hacky way is to build your app, get some binaries, you know, let it compile it and push it out. Then you get the static folder of your website. And then you just copy that over. You can send it over by F, uh, FTP, WC, uh, WSC copy or whatever it's called. You basically just get it over to your Linux box. And when it's there, I threw it in the sets directory, S, and it's the same thing. That's, our, that's the same code that we compiled down on our Windows box, just raw copied over to our Linux box. So who thinks we can actually run this? You can, you can raise your hand like, I know the demo works. <laughs> yes, Rob! <laughs> we think it's going to work! <laughs> so we fire up our uh, model web server. And we go find a browser. Eighty eighty. We ignore that. Same app, a Linux URL, served up by Linux, with hardly any changes to our Windows code base. What kind of taboo like <laughs> development is this? Has anyone, like, has anyone thought this was possible or seen something like this? All right, it's neat. So now we've changed our backend over to Postgres and Linux. We're running our application on Linux. And I think this is a very good step in trying to wean ourselves off this relationship that we've had with Microsoft and .NET. Because we can start, we can take and... Uh, Does the app, the app still on .NET or not? Yes, the apps are on .NET. Do you still have to pay licenses? Yes, but, but, uh, um, but a license for like Windows 7 isn't a real backbreaker, right? right. right? So the thing is like getting off the whole server class licensing and that that shell game that goes on with that. And also for um, that notion of, well, yeah, okay, you know, Postgres, that has a lot of merit. You know, Ruby and that stuff, that's cool too. But we have a real sunken cost in the development time we put into our .NET app. Like, surely it's going to be too hard to change, and we can't just take on that cost. When really, when you try and do it, it's so much easier than you think. Because again, the power and the speed of open source and like what the mono team's done and what Postgres is doing, it will really surprise you when you go to do it. I was just totally blown away by this. I didn't think it was, it was kind of just an office joke that we had that we can't do it, but I have no friends or social life and a lot of time. So I thought, well, I'll just order a couple of pizzas and do it. <laughs> so 15 pounds later in a few hours, bam, it worked. Mine was completely blown. 
Any questions on this process? Any thoughts on getting away from a really ugly manual deployment and getting double taboo and installing Ruby and doing a Capistrano deployment? Because then you have your .NET code being deployed by Ruby to your Linux box, running on mono. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> but it works. I don't have it set up because it's, it's kind of hacky on Windows, but it is possible to do. The other thing is that you can you know, talk about developing on Windows, and that's still, that's still going to be an issue. But Mono is kind of platform independent. It works on Mac. You know, it works on Windows. It works on Linux. So we start going in this Mono direction. Again, very minimal changes to our code base. But we can open up Mono development on our Mac. It takes the religious de debate of which platform is best and turns it on its head. Because you know what OS you're tied to, it's not important. What's important is solving your problems and making a decent app that people want or that solves you know, some need you have. So here we are, same thing. Same thing on my Mac. I don't think it'll build because I have some uh, zero errors, five warnings. Something I built on Windows in Visual Studio, deployed to Linux, it's running great on Win Linux. It's now on my Mac and running fine. So back to slides. The slides are cool. What else makes Postgres great? You guys, community. You guys' enthusiasm for the product, the willingness to want to improve things and make software better on something you really believe in is really cool and really refreshing for someone like me that's stuck in an enterprise world. And um, really happy to be here. This is really cool to see. And I love you guys' product. I'm looking forward to using it more in the future. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this happen. That's my Twitter. You guys want to play the question game or ask more questions or what? Yeah. Um, how did you deal with or did not make a difference uh, dealing with the data based sensitivity issue and the metadata incident issue? Yeah. I had a problem with that. So I decided to go the other way. Oh, okay. So in Microsoft World, where everything's case insensitive, you don't appreciate how big of a deal that is when you go to a case sensitivity, uh, case sensitive thing like Postgres. And uh, once I figured out what I was doing and how big of a deal that was, I went and redid my whole um, ETL to, to bring it all down. And uh, it, it painful, I mean, I can, all I can say is painful initially, but everything has learning pains, yeah. right? But, I think it's coming. Yeah, but for the most part in SQL Server, you can set collations, but for the most part, like you don't want to bother it. Like what it installs and does, you're just like, okay, just don't freak out on me. I'll let you do your defaults. That's cool, right? And again, in Windows and like in .NET, you're so used to and so ingrained, you know, camel casing and all that stuff, and you know, let's throw underscores everywhere because they're awesome. And it's a bit of a different world in Postgres and Linux, and that's, but, but it's. To me, um, I mean, when it really comes down to it, that's not a big deal. It's a pain point at first, but you know, you get used to it. And now I can do everything in lowercase, regardless of what I'm on, because <laughs> a lot more respect for that. That's a good question. That, yeah, I forgot to mention how sucky that was to learn. It's like playing guitar, and you get like a, a, a really bad calluses <laughs> at first. I'm like, oh, I don't want to play anymore because that hurts so bad. Uh, that's kind of like what the case sensitivity was. But you keep playing with it, you keep trying it, and before you know, you can play all day long. It's nothing. Any other questions or thoughts or anyone just completely lost? Question or lost? No. Because I'm not sure I can help either way. Question. So this is, I mean, this is what you have running right now. The mono running everything. This is what I'm doing okay. <laughs> on my own and all my projects mm -hmm. and stuff. Trying to sell this to my boss, 
you know, you're laughed at. Okay. Like, dude, no way. But again, that's, that's kind of the difference between um, being more open-minded in a pragmatic approach than someone who's just really bought in and invested and no amount of rational reasoning will get them to switch courses. And, and businesses, a lot of businesses, a lot of large businesses are just kind of fearful and change anyways. Kind of like, um, you know, someone that has cancer and they know something's wrong, but they don't want to go to the doctor because the doctor will have bad news. Sometimes, you know, the enterprise is like that. They don't want to hear change. They don't want to try change. They just want to hope it magically goes away. And that's trying to get uh, .NET people to try Postgres in general is brutal. It's, 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 I think it's a cultural issue, personally. I don't think it's any one right answer. I think it depends a lot on the person. I think it has a little bit to do with enterprise culture. And you know, I know this, I do this, I don't want to learn anything else, I don't want to leave my safety net. I mean, it, it, just entrenching, an entrenching culture. And that is like, if you buy a new car, you think it's really awesome, and you, what you do is you try and ignore the next cars that come out. Because immediately, like, you want to feel like you've made a good investment, right? And there's better things out there, but it's, it's a self-defense mechanism you have to, like, I bought this, I want to shut the world out. And I think that's part of it, too. But, but, hmm? but by doing this, you just save 100 grand, right? But the next time you have to do this? Yeah. So if you can At least. your boss's boss, and your boss is not making a smart decision three years from now, would that help? Yeah. Yes. I mean, again, to a rational person, yes. The thing is, we're at PG Con. You know, we're at developer conferences. We're learning, you know, technical details and technical merit. Our CFO, he's not going to this. He's, you know, he's flying up to Seattle, or he's being flown up to Seattle to, you know, look at the next, you know, look at, look at what SharePoint can do for you now. Whereas if we're saying, no, dude, this is going to be a lot of butt hurt. So I mean, there's that aspect of it, of the people who know the technology and love the technology aren't the ones making the technology decisions in all cases. Yeah. I think it, it, it just holds back to people not moving to the culture. You know, they are very good platform and free and so I think the biggest one is the legacy code. Um, for the existing project and uh, operation, they, I mean, the, the money is not just that hundred thousand. Yeah. You know, the years of development and uh, the user get used to the way it, it's not the boss can make the change. Basically, that is a driving the uh, decision, you know, we're going to stay with certain platforms because the uh, infrastructure is already there. Right. It's not just the license and you, you, you replace it. The legacy code is the big thing. Yeah, fear can be very paralyzing. Yeah. And I think I that's... For the new project, uh, we, we, I always encourage that you move into that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on that same, in that same vein, you know, I'll say, you know, let's, you know, let's move to Postgres. And like, again, it's, you know, I don't want to rewrite our entire back end. That's why you look at something like Mono, which makes it very, you know, very smooth, very little changes to your code exactly. transition. And you come back and you say, look, I mean, this is possible. We can do this. But again, it's, you have to have ears that want to listen and want to be willing to change and get over, you know, stigma and fear. And that's, you know, humans are the hurdle, not technology. Anything else? Or random questions? Like it doesn't have to be about. Yeah. Did you have any problems with dealing with the null values? We had a lot of constraints that allowed high school levels where in case you were working on Yeah. 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 Bad data storage is not, you know, unique to any platform. Right. And there's always going to be caveats. To me, like your ETL, your transition is a good way to, a good reason to fix that. Right. As a DBA, I'm not a big null fan. I mean, it's an unknown unknown. And like, right. if I can use any sort of excuse to shoehorn getting away from those nulls, right. even if it's a platform migration, I will take it and hop on it. 
and you know get out of the null game. Oh, dude. Isn't the other word for trigger ulcer? Like you made a bunch of ulcers. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Yeah, dude. Um, okay, so the data set I had, that's a very subjective question because are you talking about like just raw speed in like a disk issue? Or are you talking about the, uh, the, the, actual, the mapping type? Okay, well, personally, I'm a very slow learner. I'm not particularly smart. So, you know, with, with, with that out of the way, um, it probably took, I'd say, 50 hours just because I make bad decisions. <laughs> I, I, you know, to go like from the mapping and redoing it and learning, and, you know, I made really bad assumptions here and, and going back and refactoring that. And again, I was doing it on my free time, so it'd be you know after work when I'm tired and even more dumb. But I mean, it, like most problem, like how focused are you, and how how pragmatic is your approach? And and again, um, I'm used to making mistakes. Like you know, I'm in technology; I make mistakes all the time. I make bad decisions. I rely on a compiler to help me and fix that. So um, I'm pretty good at bailing out when I'm down a bad path and just starting over. I don't know if that answered your question at all. Uh, the mapping, there's a bit up front on mapping and trying to figure out the data types. And like, yo, what's a sequence? What in the world? Like, because that's, you know, a different thing. But, you know, databases are databases. You know, the tables are still organized in the same way, right? I have, um, in SQL Server, I have indexes on file groups. On Postgres, I have indexes on a table space. Like, that breakdown is already set. So it's just the um, fumbling through, you know, matching, like trying to make more, um, trying to make more binary columns for timestamps in uh, Postgres, you know, but I'm getting dates. You know, it's, it's just small cultural things, which are minor, but. And what, uh, the other thing I had was, um, since SQL Server is what I know, Microsoft tools are what I know, I was approaching a migration from the SQL Server side and trying to push from SQL Server into Postgres. And I stupidly tried that for way too long because, again, that's what I know. That's what I'm comfortable with. So I'm going to try and make it work. And I found that to be a really bad solution with their tools. I think uh, Microsoft's drivers for Oracle and just going from SQL Server or interacting with Oracle, that's pretty kosher. But when you start leaving that, you know, their little good old boy system, it gets, it gets really painful. So then I started approaching it by, I'm just going to start doing raw dumps, raw dumps of data. Just, you know, just barf out my whole table and then let Postgres suck it up, you know, bring it in that way. And I tried that. Um, also used just some of the, um, this will probably sound <laughs> silly, but you, you know, you go to the Postgres sites where it lists out the various tools, you know, so I'd start clicking and playing with those tools and trying them out. And like, you know, I did Navicat and I found that to be really cool. I don't know how respected Navicat is, that IDE or that, um, that tool in the Postgres community. But I found, I found that super easy to do it. And then, um, like, so I used that to actually get it working and see that it was possible and happened. And then go and refactor and try and, you know, do it maybe more Postgres way. So I tried lots of ways, but the biggest problem I had was trying to use Microsoft's uh, SQL Server integration services to do it, which, you know, shooting my foot trying to do it that way. Anything else? Are we done? Yeah, dude. Have you had to actively force the data? I'm not repeating any questions. The mono team, have you kind of opened any bugs with them or anything? Because I heard the mono project for a while there after Microsoft. Right. 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 Right 
Yes, and that's. Yes, uh, that's completely wrong. Uh, Novell was bought out by some company that I can't remember, and that company's uh, decision was to kind of kill off Mono. But uh, Miguel and Nat, they've been wanting to branch away from Novell already. Like they've been talking and thinking about branching away. So when that happened and when Novell pushed their hand, they went and created their own company, Xamarin. Okay. And they were able to get the code and the licenses from Novell. Like there is enough, uh, they ended on good terms to get that. So again, they're up and running as Xamarin and not as a part of Novell. And they're iterating really, really quickly. And that's how Yeah, I'd, without sounding really terse, I'd ask, the, I'd ask the Mono team and not Microsoft on that. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if you had any experience with, with dealing with the Mono team and staying in the Yeah, it's been great. The only problem I had was um, I'd go into the Mono IRC uh, chats, uh -huh. like when I'd get stuck, and I would ask what I see now is a really stupid question. And it'd be, you know, I'd ask it, and it'd be something just completely moved out, and it'd just fall on deaf ears. Like, no one would respond. So then I'd end up having to Google it and try and find a way, and then I'd see the answer and be like, oh, gosh. That was like an uber noob question, and I wasn't phrasing it the right way. Yeah, t typical IRC, like, um... There still is an active there that you Yes. Yep. And now that, um... Have you seen that? Are you guys... What are you guys doing in .NET? Are you uh, MVC or ASP or Web Forms or WPF or Silverlight or what? Okay, so have you seen how much Microsoft's now open sourced, like uh, their products on that side, like MVC and Razor and that stuff? I have not. No. I okay. Right. So one of the problems that you'll hit is that uh, micro, like MVC will be mostly open source, but it'll still have some very locked down parts, which um, which can make it really hard for the Mono team to bring in. Like when I'm on Mac, there's some things I don't natively get that I have to grab the DLLs from my Windows box and bring it in there's a licensing issue there. But I mean, it's, it's a very small hurdle. You just have to know that you know, they're not licensed yet to have that DLL. You can still use it, and it works with Mono, but you have to go and grab it and bring it into your thing. But with Microsoft now open sourcing so much of MVC and so much of that code base, code base and now taking commits, that that whole landscape is shifting a lot. And that announcement, I think, was like a month or two ago that Microsoft's going to start open sourcing all that. A, a huge boon to the uh, Mono team. I didn't hear that last bit. Right. And I mean, we're all familiar with Microsoft Legal. If they were, then you know, they'd be toast. Yeah. The, other thing, the other thing with Mono is that, um, so I built this web app. I have all my business logic. I have that project. You know, that, that's my DAO. And I have another project where I've encapsulated a lot of business logic. With Mono, since it works on everything, that's not just Mac, Linux, in Windows, that's iPhone, that's Android. They can take it all and push it down and compile it down to those mobile tools too. So when you're trying to bring cost to your company, say, look, if we go to Mono, we're built once and deploying everywhere. A huge return on investment there. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Is that a wrap? Thanks, guys. <laughs>